recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Can you guys hear me? Oh, they're still connecting. Apparently, I'm connecting too. <laughs> so let me, let me leave meeting. <laughs> okay, Nina says, give us a thumbs up. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, would you guys mind turning on your camera to make this more of an interactive session and more intimate, considering that it's a very small group? Thank you, Adrian. Yes, Nina, that's perfectly fine. Thank you. And um, I guess we'll go around the room and introduce ourselves, because um, I know that a lot of, some of you guys are a little bit more removed in terms of what year you graduated from HSA. And if you're an alumni, I would like you guys to say what year you're from. I'll start with myself. So my name is Hector Gonzalez, and I'm not an HSA alumni, but I'm currently the Senior Education Coordinator for the Health Science Academy. Um, Mohammed, you want to go next? Uh, hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Mohammed Tussar. Um, didn't go to HSA, but I went to HCOP, so I'm an HCOP alumni. So you feel Yay. me? <laughs> 2019, always one jacket, but yeah. Uh, current Health Science Academy admin assistant. I actually wrote the the grant for that to fund the HCOP program. You gotta yeah, thank her. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. And Dr. Daniels is also. You can, you can take it away. Okay, so hello everyone. Good afternoon. I hope you are all doing well. My name is Dr. Anika Daniels Ostaze, and I am the Director of Diversity Education and Research for the College of Medicine at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. I know that's a mouthful, but um, I also work as a faculty person in the institution and Fun fact, I just got my master's in public health yesterday. So this is something that is really near and dear to my heart to talk about health and all that we've been dealing with for the past year and a half now with COVID. I know probably you have all heard so much about this that you're so sick of COVID, you don't want it. You're probably gonna scream about it. But today I wanna to talk to you about getting accustomed to coming back into in-person life. You know, people wanna say this whole concept of coming back to normal. To be honest, I don't think anything will ever be what we consider to be normal. So now we're using this terminology, the new normal. So today's presentation is getting back on track, readjusting to in-person life uh, after COVID-19. So I want to start off with a little bit of humor. You know, I don't want this presentation to be dry. So I want you all to take a look at this and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Let me know if you can hear the, the sound, Hector. Hey there, this song is for those amazing okay. teachers across the country who have chosen to teach children in person this fall. They are brave, they are enthusiastic, in spite of, let's face it, a tough situation because, you know what, this school thing sucks and I cannot lie, but a lot of us are gonna try to let our boy and girl walk into a class and hope that this will last more than a month. Well, it might be rough, and wearing that mask is tough, because classes are hard for seeing, they fog up when you're breathing. Oh, baby, I'll paint you a picture. Your friends are with ya, but your homeboys in this instance Gotta keep six, six, six feet of distance, oh, that's the rule, yo You wanna be good to go, then when we send you back again You can't be out there tackling Lots of restrictions and tough decisions But one thing that is true, the teachers are there for you They're cleaning up that class, son, and dancing with the skeleton And all wearing a mask, son, give you an education So fellas, yeah. fellas, yeah. do you wanna go back? Get you back with your buddies. There's no reason to frown when 
they dress up like a clown and sing songs and they're strong and they're down to get the fiction on so teachers yeah teachers, yeah they can't wait to see oh, you yeah. so put it on dance around even if it's like a cat baby got masks oh and thank you to the hundreds of teachers who sent us videos getting pumped up for the school year you are our heroes for example thomas and georgia got much mass yeah dana in virginia got much mass come on tiffany in nebraska got much mass deborah in alabama got much mass miss luke carolina got much mass cameron pittsburgh got much mass Woo! good job babe good job take a breath take a breath thank you so much to the teachers who sent in videos we're still going through them if we didn't get to it i'm so so sorry but thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of that you did <laughs> So I figured we'd start off with a little bit of mask humor, since this is all about preparing for our lives back Where'd on you campus. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I want to use it. Okay, good. I'll share it with you. Okay. So how's everyone doing? I know we had you do surveys to see, you know, how you feel about going back to school. And, you know, we had some great results. And from what I see, this is my little word word cloud here, what we call a wordle, of uh, some of the biggest words that came out when we asked you, how do you feel about returning to in-person life? So you see a lot of you were excited, some of you are anxious, nervous, and happy. Those are the four terms that came out when we did this uh, survey. So it's really great to know that some of you are happy to go back, but you're a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. And that's what the purpose of this presentation is all about, to try to help you deal with the anxiety to try to get some of that out of your system and to let you know that you will have plenty of support and that we're going to give you as much information as possible to give you an education on how to be prepared for what you're about to return to. And for those of you who are looking to enter college, you know, some of you have the question of what it's gonna be like to be back to be on campus, or if you're not able to be on campus, what online learning on a college level is gonna be like, we're gonna get into some of those conversations. So, you know, and I'm also going to ask that, you know, at any time when you have questions, please put them in the chat room, anything you need clarification on. And, you know, since it is an intimate group, you'll get a lot of personal attention and we could talk to you directly, okay? So everybody's good, everybody's ready? All right. So first, we got to get this out of the way. You know, why are we even talking about this? So we all know that we've been quarantined and home for the past year and a half, starting back in March, I think, is when things shut down, like mid-March of 2020. And it was all due to this terrible uh, thing that they try to make look cute, by the way, this little circle with all these little prongs coming out of it. But it's a very deadly virus, unfortunately, so it's not as cute as it looks but it's called the novel coronavirus or also known as COVID-19. So the word novel itself means new and coronavirus was uh, coined by the fact that the corona itself, the virus itself looks like a crown. So all those little prongs up there, they said looks like a crown on someone's head. And then virus is pretty much disease. So now coronavirus itself is not new. Coronavirus is what uh, is a type of virus that can cause things like the common cold and other uh, sicknesses that people have had. But what's different about this one is that it's actually mutated and transformed into something that's much deadlier than the common cold. So even though you'll hear that the coronavirus has, has existed for decades, this one is so different that unfortunately the scientific community really didn't know how to handle it. So they called it the new coronavirus or the novel coronavirus. And it was discovered in December of 2019. So it was the earliest strain that they actually found of this particular uh, virus. And it was located in Wuhan, China. That's where they actually found the first uh, evidence that this, this virus was spreading. Now they consider this virus to be what they call a zoonotic disease. Now, all of you are science majors, you're all part of HSA, you should all have an idea of what this word is. Anybody want to give a, a guess as to what zoonotic means? You can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourselves and, and tell me what do you think zoonotic means? Yes, very good. Is that Kayla? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, Kayla. Great, so Kayla is correct. It originates from animals and it transfers between species. Very good. And now how does it transfer? That's the, one of the big questions. So initially, 
you know, they told us, oh, if you touch a surface, you'll, you'll catch Corona. If you breathe it in, you'll catch Corona. If you, you hug someone, you'll catch Corona. So all of those are kind of true, but to different extents. So the, the fastest way that COVID spreads is through airborne um, droplets. So if you, you sneeze and it ends up in the air and somebody has their mouth open and it gets in there, then boom, you're gonna catch it. Or you know, your eyes are open and someone sneezes in your eyes and you're gonna get it. There are a few instances where you'll touch a surface and then maybe touch your face. You might scratch your eye or you might rub your mouth or, you know, rub your nose and that's another way that you can spread it but on surfaces it can last up to three days whereas you know aerosol uh, viruses tend to be more deadly and enter your your stream your airstream much quicker you know in terms of surfaces a lot of times if you don't touch your face or if you wash your hands right away then you don't have the same concerns so it, 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 we, what we're really concerned about is the fact that once it gets into the air and it spreads, if you're in an area where it's not well ventilated, you don't have a window or you have a, a very bad or old AC unit and things are just collecting, that's when we're concerned about how much it spreads. So now uh, the biggest agency that actually monitors the activity of this disease and other diseases is the Center for Disease Control or CDC. So we all look to the CDC for guidelines as to how to deal with these diseases and how what we should be doing to minimize how the spread and all the best practices of how to address issues like this. So um, the CDC creates these standards for managing the outbreaks. And according to the CDC, when they actually start studying COVID, you know, seeing that it's it's fairly new. They wanted to see what effect it had on children because they noticed that adults were getting it fairly rapidly, but children weren't getting it as rapidly. So they wanted to know what exactly was going on. And they saw that um, although fewer children have been infected by it uh, compared to adults, children definitely have been able to get infected by the, the virus. A lot of them might be asymptomatic, meaning that they won't show any symptoms. They will get sick from it in many cases, but definitely they spread the, the germs to others. They spread the, 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 the disease to others, you know, by playing with the other people, sneezing, touching things, um, getting too close, hugging, um, uh, you know, just personal contact where children do a lot more of that than adults, especially if you're in, in team sports and things like that. So, and they noticed that as children get older, the risk actually gets higher. So high school students are three times as likely as elementary students to catch the virus. So there's something about the aging process, even at your age, that says that you're going to get this disease even faster than children that are younger than you. So that's why it's this is a huge concern. And that's why the CDC is also working with different agencies to try to, try to develop that vaccine for younger children. So now you know that there, there are uh, vaccinations for children as young as 12, and they recommend that children from 12 years and older get the vaccine to help reduce the spread. Now, although restrictions are being lifted right now, and I know people are thinking, well, you don't have to wear a mask at a lot of places anymore, and we're able to go out in public, and we can eat indoors, and we can go to concerts and things like that again, and you know everything is, rest is the restrictions are being lifted, keep in mind that COVID has not disappeared yet. It might feel like it has, because now we could do more, but it's still around. So, and it's still highly contagious. So we have to keep that in mind and know that even with the lifting of the restrictions, we have a holiday weekend coming up. There's gonna be a lot of barbecues, a lot of people hanging out. You know, we might see a spike because now people are gonna be a little bit more careless and wanna have fun and not think about the ramifications. And then as you go deeper into the summer, you're gonna have the 4th of July weekend, which is even bigger. And there's gonna be a lot more parties and a lot more hanging out, a lot more sharing of you know, drinks and food and things like that. So we have to be mindful that even though the world seems to be opening up again, that doesn't mean that we are completely out of the woods with this issue. So this is just a world graph that gives you a sense of how bad the, the coronavirus has been and continues to be. So uh, this is as of May 24th. You'll see that there were 508 
new cases as of that date worldwide. Confirmed cases around the world, over 166 million. I mean, can you even imagine how many people that is and what that looks like? And in terms of deaths, we had over three, almost 3.5 million, 3.4 million deaths. So people, this isn't the common cold. You, you know, you don't sneeze, catch a cold, get over it in a week, and that's it. You know, people are dying from this. And that's why, you know, the world had to shut down at some points. And some places opened up and shut down again because they weren't taking it as seriously as they could. Or they, or they just didn't realize how bad it was. So now we're looking at how many people have been vaccinated. Right now we have over a million people worldwide, 1.4 million people who have received their vaccinations, at least the first shot and they're working towards their second. And then if we look by region, you'll see that within the Americas, meaning North, and, North Central and South America, we had the highest uh, confirmed cases. Europe came in second. And initially, Europe was pretty bad. Europe was one of the first places to shut down. So the US didn't take it as seriously. And now we have actually gone beyond Europe in terms of our cases. And then you'll see as you go further down, the cases are a little bit less. So Southeast Asia had over 30 million. Eastern Mediterranean was about a little over 9 million, almost a million, I mean, uh, 10 million. Africa had pretty low cases in, in comparison. You know, 3.4 million people is still a lot of people to uh, contract the virus. And then the Western Pacific, Pacific was about 2.8 million. So these are a lot of people around the world that were sick. And then if you just look at the United States, and this is again, as of May 24th. So just this week, you have 21,000 new cases. So that's pretty low in comparison to where we started from, but that means it's still not over. And that's daily. So just imagine every day, these are the cases that we're looking at. Um, the amount of confirmed cases to date, we had over 32 million. In terms of deaths, we had over 584,000 people dying. And I know many of you might've had family members who were sick, who um, uh, might've, got, might've been ill from it. Some people, you might know somebody who lost a family member. My husband had it. You know, I know many of you might have known Mr. Jabari Osaze, who taught some of your uh, su summer sessions. He had it and it lasted for him in terms of severe symptoms for three weeks. And then um, he still had minor symptoms for up to six weeks. But to be honest, he still has residual effects that have not gone away since he got it. And he got it very early around March of 2020. So the fact that he still has some issues with his sense of smell is not the same as it was before. Breathing, he can still feel difference in his lungs. You know, these are things that um, still affect him. But the good news is uh, within the United States, we have over 283 people so far who have gotten vaccinated. And Jabari has survived, Jabari has healed, and he, we have both gotten vaccinated. So... So just some back to school facts, you know, why are we even meeting today? So as of May 24th, Mayor de Blasio announced that all New York City schools will be meeting in 100% in person. There will be no remote option in the fall. So there's no hybrid option. You're not going to be going between home and back to school, you know, rotating from day to day. The expectation is that everyone is going to leave their home and that you're all going to be back on campus or back in your, your, your classrooms. And school begins September 13th. So they're trying right now to do all that's necessary to make the spaces safe. So they're cleaning the classrooms, they're trying to reorganize the desks, they're trying to make sure that there's distance between students. They're talking about what kind of equipment is necessary. They're working on ventilation, you know, buildings that don't have enough windows, you know, what can they do in terms of filter systems, you know, so they're really thinking hard on how do they make it safe for you and your friends to return. Now, I know this part is also very sad. There's no more snow days because they, they have realized that during this pandemic where you were able to do hybrid education, you can learn from home on the days that you can't go in. So instead of giving you that fun snow day where you can go outside and play, now they're going to expect you to be home learning online. So there still will be some uh, virtual learning, but very minimum from what Doc, uh, Mayor de Blasio has stated. 
And again, I'll, I'll, make, I'll give a caveat that things change, you know, regularly based on what the numbers look like. And again, like I mentioned, we have a holiday season coming up. So things could change based on what we see in the next few weeks. But as of the 24th and still today, this is where we are. Um, so anytime there's an emergency or something like election day where you, you typically were off, now um, they're going to have you learning from home. And the expectation is that you're gonna socially distance. Now from the CDC guidelines and the studies that have come out, they're saying that you don't need to be six feet anymore. You can reduce it to three feet and that you'll still be safe. And that's a good thing for schools because a lot of them are old buildings that don't have the capacity to be able to just have uh, six feet of space between all of their students. So the fact that three feet is still considered safe makes it easier for some of the older schools to, to commit to making a healthy and safe environment for students. Now facts about college. So some of you might be getting ready to go into college. This is your first experience and you're thinking, wow, you know, things are gonna be so different than my friends who might've gone and told me all these great stories about parties and stuff that they did. So um, one thing I wanted to state for those who maybe didn't get into college yet or are still applying, some schools are no longer requiring the standardized tests. And that's because of all that we've seen with what's happening now. Now, those of you who already took it, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're like, why did they wait until after I took the test to decide that they're not going to do it again? I'm sorry. <laughs> but for those of you who haven't applied yet and you're thinking about it, uh, this might be a good thing for you. But also keep in mind, if you don't take the standardized test, that means that your other parts of the application must be stronger. So that means looking at your essays, getting assistance to make sure that you do well in your academic coursework, that you have a higher GPA because they have to look at something to compare you to others now that there's no longer a test that can distinguish you. So that's something I wanted to, to make sure people were aware of and that they would take that into consideration. Now it's been announced by the chancellors for both SUNY and CUNY that uh, those students will be in person and that it's re required that they are vaccinated. So if you have gotten accepted to a CUNY or a SUNY school and you're about to enter either the summer or in the fall, you have to be vaccinated. So uh, hopefully you, you are already aware of that and you're already working towards getting that done. If not, then you need to consider what your plans are for college because they really wanna make sure that this doesn't spread anymore. Other colleges might have hybrid schedules or 100% or in-person instruction. So for those of you who are not attending CUNY or SUNY, then you would really need to start doing some research on the college that you've gotten accepted to or the ones you're thinking of applying to, to see what their standards are going to be for students attending their institution. And then vaccinations might be required for some of those private and out-of-state colleges that you're considering. So that's something you might wanna know in advance if you're concerned about getting the, virus, the vaccine or if you just wanna know what um, the school is expecting of you when you return. So I included this list and I'll, I'll share it with the Arthur Ashe Institute, this website uh, called bestcolleges.com where it actually lists all of the schools that require the vaccine. So you'll know if your school is on there for those who are attending college uh, this summer or in the fall. Okay, any questions so far? I wanna make sure that I'm not giving too much information and not allowing you to jump in at any time. Okay, so let's keep going. So new campus life. One, be prepared for regular COVID testing. That's something that you might not be used to right now, especially if you haven't been leaving your house. So yes, it's annoying to have that Q-tip stuck up your nose. Believe me, I do not like it. <laughs> I do not like it at all. And you know, some institutions are trying to move towards the saliva test or the rapid test but the, some of those have not been approved uh, by the FDA to be as effective as the ones where you get the swab. So be prepared for something that might feel a little bit invasive. It feels like they're sticking it all to your brain and I, I apologize for that, but it's something that they might end up doing once a week, twice a week, you know, every other week, whatever uh, is decided by the campus and it might be random testing. So you don't know when it's coming. So that's something that uh, you should be prepared for. And I know that it's not comfortable, but also keep in mind that this is gonna keep you safe as well. So a little bit of inconvenience to have that in your nose will also just give you a sense of um, the fact that 
They're going to protect you. They're going to make sure that the virus is not rampant on that campus. And it'll allow for more things to open up so that you can have more of a normal existence. So I think that's one of the positive things about the testing. Class sizes may be smaller. So, you know, at my former institution, the largest class that I remember had a thousand students in it. I don't believe they're gonna be able to do that at this point, especially since all those seats were very close together. So I have a thousand people in one large amphitheater stuck together like sardines. I don't think they're gonna be able to do that anymore. So start thinking about the fact that it'll be a little bit harder probably to register for classes. You have to do things a little bit earlier. Uh, you need to be in contact with your advisor to make sure that they know what your interests are and what classes you'd like to be in to make sure that you get in there and you're able to graduate on time and have all the required courses that you need towards your education. So just recognize that when you are entering college. Research and shadowing opportunities. Oh, it says Matt, it should be, may be limited. I apologize for that title. So keep in mind, a lot of people looking for research opportunities, especially those of you you're all thinking about science in some form or fashion. You're looking at different fields. Research is going to help you no matter what area of science you enter. So you might want to consider that. And shadowing opportunities have been very difficult because if we're virtual for a lot of things uh, and now we're just coming back into in-person life, they're limiting how much contact you can have with patients. They don't want to reinfect patients or make them um, susceptible to anything that you might be bringing in from somewhere else if you're asymptomatic or just anyone else who may be asymptomatic. So that's something to keep in mind. And then residence halls will have more restrictions. A lot of residence halls are not allowing for guests. So you won't have your friends popping by. You won't be able to just um, have anyone come in. They're going to probably do contact tracing. So they're gonna register everyone who's in that building and keep track of everyone who's in and out in case anything happens. So those are some of the changes to expect if you are entering college to know that it will be different. But again, this is all for safety purposes. And there are other ways that you can still interact with people, which we will talk about. So I'm going to start off with the first question to see if who's listening and to make sure that you are paying attention. So true or false, you don't need the vaccine if you've already had the virus. So just type in the chat and tell me what you think, true or false. Ooh, I see a lot of people saying false. Interesting. Y'all know something I don't know? <laughs> okay, so yeah, we have some smart cookies in the room, but I should know that because y'all are all scientists in some form or fashion, right? You're all future doctors and uh, public health specialists and PAs. And so you've already been watching all this stuff. So you could probably educate me on a lot of this stuff, but yes, you're correct, false. So for those who recover from COVID-19, right? New research shows that the immunity may last up to at least eight months. However, because your body builds up natural immunity for a period of the infection, researchers warn that you can get the virus again. And there have been cases where people have gotten reinfected. So that's why it's so important to consider getting the vaccine because even if you've had it, chances are you can get it again. And the vaccine helps build your immune system and help prevent people who've had it before from getting it again. So very good. So let's try another one. Children can't spread the virus, true or false. False, false, false. Okay. So it pretty much seems like there's another consensus, right? So y'all already know all this good stuff, right? So false. The fact is children catch and spread COVID-19, right? About half as much as adults, but enough to contribute to community spread. And that, that actually increases as children get older with high school students three times as likely as elementary students to catch the virus. So this is something we talked about a little bit earlier. So I want to make sure that you are still paying attention. And then, oops, I already gave the answer to that one. So I'm gonna just talk about that. True or false vaccines have live viruses in them that can make you sick. So how many people have heard that before? You've heard that there are live viruses in the vaccine that can make you sick. If you've heard that before, say yes in the chat. Yes. 
but I figured a lot of people have heard that. And yes, it is false. You know, um, the virus itself doesn't, is not in the vaccine. So what I wanna do is talk to you about vaccines and how they actually work. And Mohammed said, I heard that the J&J &J uses the flu technique for their vaccine. We're gonna talk about that. So the key word in that statement was live vaccine. I mean, live virus, so we're gonna talk about that. So first, how do vaccines work? So vaccines, what they do is they introduce a weak or an active form of the disease in the body. So they'll take the, in most instances, the dead version or a piece of the dead virus and inject it into the bloodstream. And then the body reacts by stimulating the immune system and creating what's called antibodies. So these are the warriors that come out and fight and they try to deal with these uh, viruses before they can spread too far into the body. And then the antibodies remember the disease and now can defend against it if the person becomes exposed to the real and the live virus. So they tend to take a very, very weak form or even a dead version of the virus because they just need the body to see what the virus looks like. They want, the body before it's vaccinated has probably never seen this virus before and it doesn't know what to do when the virus enters the body. So now the main goal of the vaccine is to expose you to something so that your body has an idea of what it looks like, but not enough to make you sick from it. Just enough so that the body knows what it looks like. And when it has to, it can fight it off if you get a much worse version of it. Now, there's something called mRNA virus uh, vaccines, and that's what COVID-19 is. So we have Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, or what they call J&J, &J, and AstraZeneca. So those are considered mRNA viruses. Now, how are those different? So instead of taking a piece of the, the dead virus or the weak virus, they actually have a synthetic version. And it's, they put it into, they, they take it as a messenger. So this is supposed to be the little guy who warns the troops and says, hey, if you see anything that looks like this, run from it. You know, and it's not the real virus. It's just something that looks like the virus to give an indication that this is a dangerous guy and you need to get out of here. So it's not real, it's synthetic. It's a fake version of it. And they inject it into the body. Then now the messenger is teaching the body how to deal with it. So it tells the body, okay, you need to make this specific protein that can help you build the immune system to fight that virus. So now these proteins are being uh, developed because the messenger RNA told them you need to do this. So the proteins go in, they trigger the immune response so your body's ready to fight. So the messenger is like, get your troops ready, get the army set up. This is what you need to do to fight it off. And then now the body's producing what's called antibodies again. So similar to the first type of vaccine where it says, okay, now anytime this foreign entity enters my body, I can fight it off and the symptoms will be much, much less uh, severe if not non-existent. Or, you know, you might not feel anything at all because your body is so ready to fight that you don't even notice that you have it. And now your body's protected from the infection because you have been vaccinated. So that's the truth behind vaccinations and how they actually work. They're not little uh, nanoparticles that are injected to, to control your mind, you know, which I've heard people say, you know, it's not little computer chips that are coming into the little um, virus uh, and spread throughout your body. It's not um, little robots that are going into your body trying to change your DNA. You know, I've heard everything under the sun. DNA and RNA are not the same thing. And hopefully as science majors, you've learned this in school already, you know that the DNA is a double helix, the RNA is a single helix, they function differently. So your DNA will not be affected. You're not gonna be genetically mutated. You're not gonna be mind controlled. None of this that you've heard some of your friends maybe say to you is true. And you as a budding scientist will be the ones to actually tell them the truth and to educate them on what a vaccine is all about. So now let's talk about the history of vaccines. And it's important because, and I know I'm talking a lot about vaccines and it might seem like I'm trying to convince you to get it. 
maybe to some extent I am, but I do respect those who may not be able to get it for various reasons, maybe for religious reasons, maybe, you know, you still have concerns, maybe you have comorbidities or some other issues that make it difficult for you to get the vaccine. Um, but I just want to provide education and then leave the option up to you to decide what you're going to do and to share this information with your family members and your friends and you decide what you wanna do. But I wanted to give you a little history lesson so that you would understand why vaccines even became a, a thing and where it actually comes from. And many of you might not realize it. So let's talk about the spread of infectious diseases. So one of the most infectious diseases in history was smallpox, okay? It was a, a disgusting disease. I'm gonna show you images of what it looks like. Hopefully you're not eating anything or you haven't just eaten because it's not pleasant. So I'm gonna give you that warning in advance. But you know, the smallpox uh, disease spread rapidly. And unfortunately it spread in a primarily, I'm gonna talk about one specific area in Boston because during this time, this was during uh, enslavement when colonizers were bringing enslaved Africans, not just from the continent of Africa, but they were making stopping points over in the Caribbean and grabbing people from the Caribbean and enslaving them and bringing them to the United States. And so they called these cargo ships. We knew that these are actually people, not cargo. So you see this image of an enslavement ship. These are all bodies. These, all those black images there are bodies of people that were forced into a very tight space, half naked, chained together, not able to move for months at a, a time. They ate in the same place. They defecated in the same place. They were urinating in the same place, everything in the same place. So you can imagine how much disease spread. And you already had these people that were being brought from Africa and being brought from the Caribbean who were not as exposed to Europeans who had their own diseases that are now infecting their bodies and their bodies are not accustomed to it. So now smallpox becomes rampant because you have all these people confined to very tight, small spaces in their own excrement, not eating very well with very low immune systems and smallpox ended up being very rampant. So by the time these enslaved Africans were brought to Boston, half the city of Boston was infected. As many as 30% of those infected people died. And you would, during that time, you would see there were quarantines, quarantined in their house with a sign that says, God have mercy on this house. So people did not want to have anything to do with individuals who were sick. There was no formal quarantine like we had now with COVID. So people would actually just run away from sick individuals. They didn't want to be anywhere near these people. They thought it was disgusting. And they were like, you stay where you are, stay away from me. I don't want what you have. And you'll see that smallpox killed over 300 million people. So again, this was a deadly uh, disease that spread and had a huge impact on, the, on a lot of different people. What most people don't recognize is that this gentleman here, I call this the legacy of Onesimus. So Onesimus was an enslaved African who may have been from Libya or Ghana. It's unclear because we don't have the records during his time, of course, uh, to determine where he came from because they didn't always keep track of where they were capturing enslaved Africans. And his birth name wasn't even Onesimus. So we don't even know what his birth name was. He was given this name by the person who captured him and it, by the person who um, purchased him after he was captured. So the enslaver called him Onesimus, which meant useful. So that's unfortunate that now this man um, did not have his own name, was stripped away from his family. He had a wife and two children. Two, uh, two children died when they were very young. And the person who purchased him is the gentleman on the right. I don't know if I really should call him gentleman, but the the person Cotton Mather. So Cotton Mather was his owner and he purchased Onesimus in 1706. And what was interesting is that Cotton Mather was living during this time of the smallpox epidemic and said, you know, it's really interesting how smallpox is rampant and with the conditions that your people, you know, enslaved Africans were in. Why is it that your people aren't dying as much as we are? How come your people aren't uh, um, getting as high infection rates as we are, but all of the white people at the time were dying off like flies? And Onesimus said, well, where I came from on the continent, 
we had a solution for this. You know, he knew how to um, inoculate people from smallpox. So he actually ends up sharing this information with Cotton Mather. Now, after he shared this information and taught this guy how they were able to avoid getting sick or dying, he thought, well, now maybe he'll let, he'll let me be free because now I've saved the population with immense knowledge. And of course, no, Cotton Mather didn't want to give him his freedom, actually started charging him for things and made it very difficult for him to eventually purchase his freedom later on down the line. But because of what Onesimus taught him, smallpox was actually eradicated in 1949 in the US and 1980 worldwide. So how was this done? So this is what it looks like for someone to have smallpox. Imagine encountering someone like that on the train. Now, many people don't take COVID-19 as seriously because you don't really see the symptoms on the outside. So you think, oh, it's not that bad. Okay, if I sneeze, I cough, I have breathing problems, whatever, I'll get over it. But imagine if COVID looked like this. I bet you all of you would be running out to get some vaccine <laughs> because you think acne is bad. This is not, this is really disgusting. So I would think that you would not want to look like this walking down the street and people will run from you like you had the plague because technically you do. <laughs> so this is how serious diseases were during that time and how it could become again if we don't take vaccinations seriously. So Onesimus told Cotton Mather that in order to deal with this, they actually drew out some of the pus from one of those bumps on a person's face or somewhere on their body. And then they cut a, an incision in a non-infected um, person. So they cut a little uh, slit in a person's arm and they took that pus and stuck it into that person's arm. So this is when they were actually using the live virus to, um, to create some kind of immunity. So it was actually exposing the person, but giving a small piece of it, not, the, not enough where the person would get so violently sick or die, but enough where the body would recognize a foreign entity is there and then fight against it. And then when the body actually healed and the wound closed up, it, it actually created a visible scar. So you would actually see a little like scar on this person's body and that's how you knew that that individual was vaccinated. So with this information, Cotton Mather actually shared it with a physician in the area by the name of Zabdiel Bolston. So around 1721, he decided to actually try this technique. And due to the, the success of the technique, the deaths in Boston dropped from one in seven for people untreated to one in 40 for people who were treated. So it showed that it actually was a successful process. Now, during the time that this happened, people were also, there were a lot of anti-vaxxers or people, I don't believe it, this is crazy, I'm not doing it. You know, they didn't want someone sticking live viruses in them. Um, but after being educated and after seeing people get treated and healing, this is how they were actually able to eradicate smallpox. So it no, it no longer exists. So this is what we would like to see happen to COVID-19. But one of the takeaways is your ancestors were the ones who developed the technology to create vaccinations that the entire world benefits from now. So this isn't just uh, white people that are trying to harm black people or people with power trying to destroy people without power. These were your ancestors who created the technology to help save the world and they taught others who are now trying to do the same thing. So this is something I wanted to make sure people were aware of because I'm sure they don't teach this in high school and they probably don't even teach this in college. I mean, how many of you have ever heard this? If you heard it, you know, put it in the chat. Tell me that you somebody told you about Onesimus. Hopefully, you if you did, you're one of the lucky few. But if not, this is something that you should be sharing with your friends and letting them know that somebody potentially from your ancestry was the one who created this great technology. And as scientists, you should really know this information. So let's talk about masking. So now that we talked about that, uh, diseases and viruses and how they spread, now let's talk about how to be safe. So this should help to deal with some of the anxieties that some of you might have um, around 
being in, in person again and being around people and not knowing who's infected, not knowing who's vaccinated and all these other things. So let's talk about masks and how we reduce the risk. So if you look to your left and you see the first individual, he has no mask, but he has co he's a COVID carrier. And the person on the right at the uh, in the first row is someone else who's next to him and has no mask. So that's the highest risk. So someone who's near another person who is infected and neither one of them has a mask, that's the highest risk of catching COVID. The next level is someone who's infected with no mask and then someone who's not infected or not infected yet and has a mask. It's still a high risk because what? It's important to realize that the mask you wear is not for you. It's for the other person. You're wearing your mask. I'm sorry? Question. So this is assuming the other person is not vaccinated, right? Yes. Okay, so this is before yes. the, on the, in, the inclusion of vaccines, okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So now you have someone who is a carrier and not masked and someone who is not a carrier yet, who is masked and not vaccinated. Now the mask, like I said, is for you because it's preventing when you talk from spewing out anything to that individual. So the guy with the mask is protecting her, but she's not protecting him because she could still spew stuff out at him. And, you know, small particles might get through the mask, but it's, you know, it's not as much a risk, but it's still a high risk. Then you have the lower risk. So someone who has COVID who is masked. So when they talk, they're not spewing anything out at you, but you're not masked and you're not vaccinated. So it's a much lower risk because the chances are that it's gonna get through the mask and hit you might not happen, but you know you still wanna be better safe than sorry. So it's a still a lower risk, not a complete end of the risk. And then the lowest risk of catching it, almost um, non-existent if you follow the social distancing and everything else that the CDC guidelines have um, given is if you both wear a mask. So you're both protecting each other so this is also about community. It's about protecting each other. It's not just about thinking about yourself and saying, I don't want to wear the mask because I don't like how it feels. You know, I think it's crazy. You know, it's annoying to walk around all day long, you know, six hours with a mask on my face. I'll tell you, it's more annoying to not be able to breathe and to be on a ventilator. It's more annoying to be sick and sneezing and coughing and not be able to do the things that you want to do because you and not have fun anymore because you're sick. So if the mask is a little bit annoying, I'm sure you'll be able to live with it. Now, how to wear the mask properly. It's not a chin guard. So your mask shouldn't be underneath your, your chin or your neck or on your forehead or hanging off the side. It should completely cover your nose and your mouth. So I see a lot of people just putting it on their mouth and their nose is exposed. So what happens when you sneeze? Particles come out your nose. You know, so you should be covering both nose and mouth and mouth. That is the best way to protect yourself and to wear these masks. So I just want people to be clear on that, because even if you see other people doing it, you're the smart ones. So you could talk to them about the fact that they're wearing their masks wrong and that they're not being very considerate because they're not protecting you from um, potential exposure. Okay, so let's talk about some do's and don'ts to, to make you feel safer. So do wear your mask indoors and wear required. I know again, restrictions are being lifted, but when you're gonna be back in school, they're gonna tell you in your classrooms, you still have to wear those masks. When you go to college and you're in the classroom, they're gonna tell you to wear those masks. Stay six or three to six feet apart. You know, um, Like I said earlier, they did uh, reduce it to three feet, but if you could do more, you know, why not? Wash your hands regularly and wash them for a longer period of time. And with soap, not, not just water, you need the soap to kill the germs. Uh, so make sure you're washing properly and use hand sanitizer. So, you know, I'm one of those people who before the pandemic, I was against handshaking because every time I went to an event and I had to meet 500 people and everybody wanted to shake my hand, I would go home and be sick and I'd be so upset because I could almost tell who gave me the cold because I remember seeing people sneezing and coughing and then walking up to my table and wanting to shake my hand. So I was so against handshaking. I, I'm, to some extent, I'm glad that we're moving away from that. But now I see people are trying to do it again. I'm still doing the elbow bump. 
<laughs> and I'm probably going to do that for the rest of my life at this point because I do not. Because remember, COVID isn't the only thing that spreads. You still have the flu. You still have all kinds of other stuff you can catch. So, you know, use the best practices. Use this as a learning experience. Now that we know how COVID has spread and we know other things can spread, stop with the handshaking. That's, that's going to be my campaign. If I run for anything, it's going to be, I will not handshake or any, make anyone else shake hands while I'm in position. So yes. So now use hand sanitizer if you do have to hand, shake someone's hand, if it seems completely rude. I know if you're interviewing for internships and somebody might still wanna shake your hand and you have to do it because you don't wanna lose a chance to get a research opportunity or an internship and shake their hand, but in your pocket, make sure you have that hand sanitizer and put it on as quickly as you can and then run to the bathroom to wash your hands as soon as you have the opportunity. Clean your personal spaces. So constantly clean your desk, make sure there's nothing um, that's hanging out there. Remember I said that sometimes the virus can last up to three days, depending on what the surface is, whether it's a wooden surface, a, uh, a steel surface, you know, it, it changes depending on the surface, but just keep your, your area clean. That's just a best practice in general, regardless of whether it's COVID or not. And eat healthy because you need a, a, a strong immune system. You know, that helps you fight these uh, diseases. So you wanna eat the best foods possible to give you a chance. Now, things you don't wanna do, don't cough and sneeze in your hand. Oh, sorry. So remember I said, this is why I didn't wanna shake hands because a lot of people don't think about it. They cough, they sneeze <laughs> in their hand and then they're like, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. And they've just exchanged germs with you. So now what do you do? You cough in your elbow, <clears throat> you sneeze in your elbow. So now if you do shake someone's hand, whatever germ is in your elbow is not on your hand and you're not spreading it to the next person. Don't share food and drink. I know a lot of you know teenagers love to share drinks. They're sucking on the same straw. They wanna taste their friend's food. It's nice and everything. No, have them pour something out into a separate cup and you can taste it that way or break off a piece of what they're eating and, and don't share saliva. That's where all this stuff is ruminating. So get into a habit of, you can still share, but share in a healthy way. And I, as you see, I say, don't shake hands <laughs> unless you have to. Uh, so I'm reiterating that. And then don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth after you touch a surface or touch someone else. And sometimes it's unconscious. You don't realize it. You know, maybe you have allergies and you, you're just so annoyed. You start rubbing your eyes and you're scratching and stuff like that. But if you are someone who gets allergies and you know that that's something you're gonna do often, again, wash your hands. And then don't hang out in, in large unmasked crowds, okay? So whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated or what have you, these large crowds, you don't know who else is there. You don't know who is vaccinated and what they're spreading, how they feel. And some people might just be doing it because they wanna go against the grain. They just don't wanna be told what to do. So you wanna put yourself in a situation where you're always safe. So I would say stay out of those large groups. So how do we prepare for this re return? I talked about a lot of tips you know, earlier, just how to be safe, you know, some, some facts on how the virus spreads, how vaccine, vaccines were created and why you know, they're not mind controlling devices. So now let's talk about how to prepare for this return. So reducing anxiety. Think about the fact that you haven't seen your friends in a while and now you are going to see them again. So going back to school isn't all that bad because now you won't be alone. Now you don't have to talk to people through this box that I'm talking to you right now. Now it doesn't have to look like the Brady Bunch, you know, or Hollywood Squares. I guess I'm dating myself, but you know, you don't have to talk to people in a square anymore. Now you can actually see your friends. And if you're vaccinated and they're vaccinated, you can actually hug again. So I think some of the, the great things about going back to school is seeing the people that you love and care about and that you miss. So reconnect with those people, you know, contact them, share information. Maybe you could still uh, get together, be safe. Two of you can go and have something to eat, you know, at a, a cafe or whatever, as long as you're socially distanced, maybe you can do it outside. If you do it inside, you know, be safe. Reorganize your routine and develop a practical schedule. So I know, at least for me, since I've been working from home, I shaved off three hours of commuting. And that's three hours of my life that I can do all kinds of stuff with. And I have loved it. I have used it to cook more. I've used it to exercise. I've used it to hang out um, in my home and clean up and, and redecorate and do all kinds of stuff. 
So now I'm going to be giving that back. I'm going to have to get back on the subway. I'm going to have to give up that three hours time. So, you know, how does that feel? It's hard. So that means you have to create a new routine, a back to school routine. So that means getting up again, having your alarms set. So I would suggest that you start getting used to it now. If it's something that takes you a while, you know, maybe during the summer, get up early, prepare yourself as if you're going to school and do something productive and keep a schedule so that when school actually starts, you're not stressed out about getting up and being able to get, be awake and do what you have to do. As always, you should be getting a good night's sleep. That always helps with anxiety. What makes you nervous is that you're tired a lot of times. So you should be trying to get some sleep, uh, which means don't sit up all night watching TV or playing games, you know, on your Nintendo or Xbox, or whatever you're using. Um, go to bed at a decent hour. You know, I'm not telling you to go to bed at six o'clock like you're some old person, but I am telling you to go to bed before 12 p.m. or 12, sorry, 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. in the morning because you do want to get as much sleep as you can because you're going to have to get up early. Uh, get involved, I'm sorry, do yoga, do exercise, meditate, do whatever you like to do to keep yourself moving because moving helps with anxiety. When you're sitting in the same spot all the time and you're just ruminating over the same ideas and you're just thinking, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, then it stresses you out. But if you're doing yoga, if you're exercising, if you're moving your body, it's less time for you to focus on things that might be causing you stress. And meditation is actually great because it helps you control your breathing. You're not as um, anxious. You're not you know, hyperventilating, you're just sitting there, breathing deeply, focusing on your inner strength, and you'll feel much better. Get involved in your favorite activities. You know, I know sports are going to be open again, so maybe start practicing. You know, you might have to practice solo for a while. I have one friend that can help you practice if it's baseball, if it's soccer, or whatever. You know, start doing some of those things that you enjoyed and prepare for doing it in, in the fall and have fun with it. If you're going to work hard, you should play hard. I, I honestly believe that. But you definitely have to work hard first to make the play worth it. Because if you don't work hard and you just play hard, then that's when you become stressed. So get your work done first, get it out the way, and then you can play as much as you want because now you don't have to sit and worry about the stuff you didn't do. Appreciate the small things. You know, I have started to do that now that I've been away from work. You know, I'm looking at the fact that the sun comes up every morning. I'm looking at the weather and how it's getting better outside. It's getting warmer. I'm looking at the beautiful flowers that are blooming. You know, I didn't go outside for more than once a week for a year and a half. So now I'm trying to get out more and I'm actually going to take walks out in the park. I'm looking at the flowers. I'm looking at the animals. You know, that helps you deal with anxiety because now you realize that there's more in the world than just you. You're no longer just focusing on you and your problems. You're looking at all the beauty that's out there and feeling good about it. And then, you know, if you're not able to stop focusing on you, then volunteer and focus on someone else. You know, volunteering feels good because you're giving back to the community. You're helping someone be better. So that can help you deal with your own anxiety because now you realize other people have problems too. It's not just you. And if you can help them solve their problems, then, hey, guess what? You can solve some of your own problems too. So I think volunteering helps you recognize that. Know that you're not alone. We're all struggling. I have to go back to work in July. I'm not looking forward to having to go back to work in July. I like working from home, um, but I also do like having a job. <laughs> so if that means that I have to compromise and go back to work, then you know it's how you look at things. You, should, you change your outlook on life and you recognize that things could be worse. A lot of people lost their jobs during this COVID cycle. A lot of people are homeless. A lot of people are struggling with funds. A lot of people aren't able to eat. Um, so I have to remember that I'm in a position where I am okay. And you have to remember the things that you have and that you are okay. And that yes, you might have struggles, but there are always other people who are struggling much more than you are. And then talk to people you trust. Now that you're gonna see your friends again, talk to them about how you feel, be honest with each other. You know, Take care of each other, support each other. You know, you should be able to talk to each other about what you're dealing with and how you feel and, and know that somebody's out there to support you. And then be open to change, you know, because if there's anything constant in the world, it's change. Things will always be different and you have to embrace it. You, you, couldn't, you shouldn't be afraid of it. You shouldn't um, be anxious about change. Change can be a good thing, but you, it's the mindset that you carry to make sure that you feel that way. Now, how to be academically prepared. I know with all the chaos of y'all going 
to high school. And some days it was in person, some days it was at home. You had this weird hybrid schedule. They tried to make you all go back. Then the cases went up. Then they made you go back home and you were just all over the place. And I'm sure the way teachers were teaching probably wasn't as effective as it was in class. You probably didn't get as much material done. They probably didn't get through all the stuff that you needed to know. And you're probably thinking, well, when I get to college, am I going to be prepared? Do I have enough information? Do I have a strong enough GPA? Do I, you know, what do I need to do to be better? And did this pandemic mess up my academic career? So the answer is you can always fix whatever you think is broken. If you feel that you are not academically prepared, then you have a whole summer to catch up. So if there's material that you feel that you didn't understand or that um, you weren't prepared for, you didn't finish reading your text, I know it doesn't sound like fun. You're like, why would I do self-learning during the summer? But I know I'm talking to a different population of students because you are all Health Science Academy students. You're all top of your class. You're all doing very well. You know, you have strong grades and you all wanna be doctors and public health specialists and nurses and all of that. So you, you're coming to this with a different mindset. You wanna be prepared. You want to be ready for school. So I'm telling you that the best way to do it is to start now, you know, get your materials for those going off to college, start looking at what courses you think you wanna take and start preparing for that. Create a study schedule and stick to it. So if you're going back to high school, create a schedule of when you're gonna eat, when you're gonna study, you know, and, and pretty much high school, they kind of dictate a lot of that for you already. But if you're going to get involved in activities after school again, then put that on your schedule and then ma manage your time for sleep and homework and all of that stuff. So it will help you be more prepared. Practice time management, that's, that's what scheduling is all about, knowing what you're doing and when you're doing it and making sure you're sticking to that time frame. Form or join a study group. So you should be studying together. And I'm gonna tell you, for those of you who are interested in being doctors, med school is all about group learning. You can't do it by yourself. They're gonna make you study in groups anyway. So you should start getting into the habit of studying with your friends. Of course, do it safely, do it with your mask, uh, socially distanced, but get into a study group. And those who you think are stronger in the subject that you wanna be strong in, pair yourself up with them and say, hey, let's work together. Help teach me this so I can make sure I'm prepared academically. Write down your questions or any subject areas that you're confused about so that when you get to school, you can ask those questions of your teachers and see if they can help you, you know, very early on so that you're not um, falling behind in your class. Meet with your academic counselor as early as possible. So I know at high school, you have a high school advisor, you, you know, as soon as you can get in the door and meet with them, start talking, especially for those of you who are thinking about applying to college who haven't done it yet. And then for those of you who are already going into college, start talking to your advisors on college campuses and talk to them about the amount of credits you need to register for, what the class size is gonna be, you know, how things are gonna change due to COVID and how that would affect you so you could prepare and be ready to get the work done. Uh, there are also supplemental courses that are often offered for free on your campuses. And they're like tutorial sessions to help you be stronger in different subjects like bio and chem and physics and what have you. So find out what programs are available at the school that you're going to. Also recognize that there are special programs and I, sh I should have listed this here, but I will share this. Uh, I'll, I'll send this slide deck to Arthur Ashe, the Arthur Ashe Institute, and they can send it out to you and the rest of the students who might not have been able to, to attend. But there are programs like HEOP, EOP, it's the Higher Education Opportunity Program, the Educational Opportunity Program. So the difference is HEOP is for private schools, EOP is for public schools. Then there's SEEK. SEEK is something that's just available at CUNY. And then there's something called ASAP, which is uh, Accelerated Study uh, and Academic Preparedness, which is also on the CUNY campuses. These are all programs that are typically for students who are financially disadvantaged or might have lower household incomes. And it helps you get scholarships. It helps you uh, pay your tuition. They give you stipends sometimes. They help you get research opportunities. They help you get additional tutoring. There's a whole lot of resources available to you. So I'll, I'll list that in the slide and I'll make sure that you get access to it. But that will definitely make sure that you are academically prepared when you're getting into college. And then ask for help. You know, I know a lot of people think that asking for help is taboo or it makes it seem like you're weak or, you know, you're, you're less prepared than other people. But guess what? The people who are highly prepared 
ask for help. <laughs> That's why they're so successful because they're the ones who are always in the teacher's face asking questions or they're always in the, gu the guidance counselor's office asking for resources. So be smart, be just like them and ask for help because even if they don't tell you they're asking for help, they're asking for help. So just do it. There's no taboo against it and it actually will make you a better student. Can I make a comment? Um, sure. I have a friend who is rather senior at CUNY and CUNY's enrollment has dropped with COVID. Mm. So they are particularly in a good mood as you're either entering college or continuing college if you're going to a CUNY school to give out the financial aid they have available, right? Because they mm. have to distribute it and enrollment's mm. down. Mm -hmm. They want to encourage as many students to either come for the first time or return to CUNY. So going back to Dr. Sazi's point about asking for help, if you need additional financial aid or additional tutoring, this is certainly the summer to ask because the, their staff is also coming back on campus this year and they need to increase student enrollment. And one way to engage you as a student is to give you more assistance. So if you need it, do not feel ashamed to ask for it. Definitely. Thank you for adding that, Dr. Valmont. Okay, safety. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Gonzalez to intervene. I know he's going to have a poll for all of you to talk about safety and how you feel about it and any questions you may have. So I'm turning it over to you. So here is a poll that we're asking everyone to respond to. What are your safety concerns when returning to in-person life? So is, are you concerned about um, contracting COVID even if you were vaccinated, contracting COVID because you weren't vaccinated, uh, the pandemic and related issues, commuting to school, racial climate, not wanting to get vaccinated even if it's mandatory, social issues that might arise from the pandemic or socializing with friends, family, classmates and administrators. So, ooh, so we've already gotten some answers. So. Contracting despite being vaccinated seems to be a big concern. Okay, commuting to school. Okay, so it's changing, so I'll wait. So we're at 70%. So we still have some more people to respond or are they counting us too, Hector? Uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. They're counting us too. But we had, I would give maybe like another 20 seconds. Okay. And Dr. V, uh, Merle, um, Tiffany and Mohammed, if you guys want to answer the survey, <laughs> why not? Yeah, I answered the survey. <laughs> I did answer it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, it's Thank not you. letting me answer it, but I would say for me, it's commuting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 100% uh, completed. Okay, great. So from what I see, most people are concerned about catching COVID despite being vaccinated. And then the next, it seems like there are three that are tied, commuting school. Um, show us the results. Oh, no. oh, I'm sorry, can I show you the results and see the results the same time? There we go. Can you see it? No? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you, yeah. There you go, thanks. Sorry. So it looks like commuting to school is 40% of the concern. And then social issues, you know, spiking crimes, things like that. So we, we're going to talk about that. So thank you so much, Mr. Gonzalez. Let's, before I go, go further into safety, because the area that I'm going to focus on in this safety is, is dealing with crimes and dealing with other issues that have happened in addition to COVID, because COVID wasn't the only thing that we experienced in 2020 and that we continue to experience in 2021. But in terms of uh, catching COVID while vaccinated, the chances are very minimal at this point, you know, and a lot of times when you've heard that someone has uh, contracted COVID while vaccinated is because they've only gotten the first dose. So it's really important to ask people, did you get both doses if they got anything other than Johnson and Johnson, because I know Johnson and Johnson is one dose, but for Moderna and um, AstraZeneca and the others, there are two dose vaccinations. So you're not completely protected if you just get the first dose and you don't go back for the second. So there is a chance that you can still contract the virus at that point. But if you get both doses and within 10 days after that second dose, you should be fairly confident 
that you will be fine. And even if you were to contract it, you would probably be asymptomatic and you will not even know that you had it, but there are very few cases of that happening. So I think you would be in a better position if you were vaccinated than if you were not, because you have a much higher percentage of getting COVID if you are not vaccinated. And that would be a greater fear. So I just wanted to address that, but thank you so much for participating in that poll. I think it's incredibly important for people to talk about what their anxieties are and to, for us to address that. Uh, I actually just looked at the chat and I realized Nina Pluvio said, I did save a lot of money by not commuting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you, I when I first saw this um, pandemic happening, I didn't know how long it was going to last, and I didn't cancel my Metro cards that I get delivered to my house from my work, and I didn't cut it off until maybe six months into the pandemic. So I had like five hundred and eighty dollars worth of Metro cards, <laughs> and I almost scalped them outside of the subway because I wanted my money back. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily the expiration date on those cards uh, won't be until the end of this year and next year. So I could still use them. So I didn't get my money back, but um, at least I could still use them. Dr. But, Daniel Fosaze, is it okay yes. if I just uh, share the results again, just so that we can take a couple of Sure, screenshots? of course. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you. Can everyone else see the results? I can't see any head nods or yeses or yes, no. Yes, we, we yes. see it. Yes. Okay, yes. great. We want so. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great. No problem. So, so let's talk about other safety issues. So during this time of COVID-19, the world stopped, but other things were going on and it made it even more challenging to deal with the pandemic. We started dealing with issues of police brutality. We started dealing with issues of race uh, hate, hatred and, and um, anti you know, sentiments towards the Asian community because people now started spreading rumors about how things started. So let's talk about the Asian hate um, situation that we're in right now. And this is something that's not new. I don't wanna make it seem like all of a sudden now people are talking about Asian people just because of the coronavirus. This has happened for a, a much longer time before then. I don't even know how many of you noticed that there were some Asian people who were here in America wearing face masks well before the pandemic. And that's because of issues that were happening in different countries in Asia where they were dealing with things that were like of toxic fumes, and smog and things of that nature. So people would look at them and say, well, why are they wearing these masks and what are they spreading and what's going on? And that started conversations right there in terms of how people were treating the Asian population. But, you know, racial discrimination has, has happened for centuries. You know, this is not something new, but now I, I wanna deal with it in the context of COVID. So what's causing uh, this new founded hate, a whole new level of hate um, in the community? And it's the stereotyping due to the COVID-19 outbreak, as well as mistreatment due to misinformation. So yes, we know that the virus started in Wuhan, China. That doesn't mean that everyone from Wuhan, China had the virus and that it was done maliciously, that um, they were trying to cause the world to shut down, that they were trying to make other people sick. It doesn't mean that now any Asian person you see is a potential carrier and that you should be worried about being near them. So, you know, this is some of what's happening in people who, what I call mental midgets, are running around saying things inappropriately to try to stigmatize an entire community. Now imagine you're already afraid to catch the virus and now you're afraid of someone beating you up because they think that you're the one spreading it. You know, you're afraid to go to the subway because you think if you're in the subway alone, someone's gonna jump on you. Someone's going to attack you and say, you're the reason for this to happen. So we need to one, look out for each other and two, educate people so that they're not running around with these ignorant ideas of why the, the, the vaccine, uh, how, why the virus has spread. I've just given you a whole presentation on how the, the um, virus spread. So you can actually go and educate these, me these mental midgets and tell them that this is not the way it happens, that you cannot pinpoint a particular race of people and say that they're the reason that this has uh, started. 
So strategies to address potential threats. So uh, for people who are in the Asian community or people who are friends with those in the Asian community, always be aware of your surroundings. I mean, this can happen to anyone, but for right now in this particular community, you're gonna have a heightened sense of concern. You're going to wonder what's in the area, who's looking at you, who's um, thinking what, and you're not sure. So you always need to be a, a aware of your surroundings, but you do need to stay calm because not everyone is malicious. We already know that. Not everyone is looking to harm you. Not everyone is thinking, you know, you're the one who spread the virus. It's, it's all about, you know, you trying to destroy our communities. Not everyone's thinking that. What you need to do is combat misinformation with truth. And yes, it shouldn't be your responsibility to have to educate others. Believe me, being a black woman in America, I'm constantly having to educate people on everything from not touching my hair to pronouncing my name correctly to not, you know, assuming that I'm less intelligent because of my skin color. There's all, so I know how frustrating it could be at the end of the day when you always have to be the one to educate others. But if they don't know, they don't know. And you can't assume that they will know. You can't assume that someone's going to educate themselves. So yes, that means it ends up falling on, on us to have to educate them. Walk away from conflict. If you see someone who wants to start an argument with you and you don't think, that they think they're rational and you don't think sharing the truth with them right then and there is gonna make a difference, walk away. To say, look, I don't want any trouble. I respect your opinion. I am not the cause of this. I don't, you know, I don't want you to think that I'm the cause of this. And I'm just going to stay away from you if you think I am the cause because I'm not trying to harm anyone and just walk away from it. And if you see something, say something. You hear this on the subway all the time. But, you know, as opposed to just sitting there with your phone, you know, making viral videos, tell somebody what's going on. Find somebody and let them know that someone's being harmed and try to help save people. We have to look out for each other. Travel in groups when you can. I know that sounds kind of counter. Uh, intuitive because now they're saying don't be in large groups, but I'm saying groups like two, three people so that you're not alone if you're concerned about your safety, especially if you're going to the subway or if you have to travel late at night or early in the morning to get to where you're going. Try to partner up with somebody, buddy up with somebody and commute together. Uh, let people you know trust where you are. Let people you trust, sorry, know where you are and where you're going so that you're never somewhere that no one knows you're there. And then if something happens, they can't help you. So always, you know, and I know teenagers are like, I don't want you to always know where I am. Maybe I want to go hang out with my friend. I don't want you to know about it. At least tell them what vicinity you're in if you don't really want to say who you're hanging out with. But, you know, I'm going to be at this place at this time or I'm going to be after school running track or something. So someone knows where you are. And if they're expecting you to be back at a certain time and you're not there, they can, you know, uh, raise the flag and, and set an alert for you. Again, look out for each other. We all have to, to be our best friends and make sure that everybody is safe. Talk about it, you know. The only way to get this to stop is to talk, educate people, talk about it. I know people, you, you love Snapchat and you love, um, you might not love Facebook anymore because all the old people are on Facebook, but you know, I'm sure you're on TikTok and maybe still Twitter and all these other things that are, and you know, within the clubhouse, you know, if you're all in those spaces, talk about what's going on and how you feel and share the truth so people can get past the ignorance. If you don't talk about it, then you can't ex expect people to know about it and change their thought process. And then get involved. You know, I'm not saying go out and run into a protest, but if you are going to protest, be safe. Let people know that you're there. Wear your mask, socially distance. And if you see the police anywhere, steer clear. You know, if you see that something's about to go down, leave. You know, protect yourself. You don't want to put yourself in more jeopardy because of what's happening. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where now not only are you being attacked by people who are ignorant, now you're being attacked by people who you thought were going to be protecting you. So be careful when you're in any kind of protest situation, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't get involved and you shouldn't say anything. Maybe protesting isn't your thing. Maybe you need to join an organization that's against Asian hate or just about educating people in general. Or maybe you just wanna be in a cultural organization with people who understand who you are and where you come from because it makes you feel more comfortable. So these are all things that you really should consider doing. Okay. Now, in addition to the fact that we had to stress over people 
hating on a whole community because of a virus and misinforming others. Now we have the Black Lives Matter movement. And again, this is something that has happened for centuries. We have to keep in mind that um, the relationship between Black people and the police has always been a tenuous one. I don't know how many people even recognize that the prison system was actually developed after enslavement ended because they still wanted a way to be able to, um, to deal with people that they thought were unsavory. And they just assumed that people of a certain race were those unsavory characters. So also, um, law enforcement came from the Fugitive Slave Act. Exactly. <laughs> so somebody was listening in their history class. That's me. <laughs> there you go, William. Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> but yes, William is right. The Fugitive Slave Act led to what we know today as the prison industrial system. It wasn't done by accident. It wasn't just to put the bad guys away. It was to deal with a population that the United States did not want to deal with. Now that they brought all of these individuals from another continent and these people are going to stay here and these people are gonna work and they're gonna take jobs away from them and all this other stuff. Now they have to find another way to deal with us. So this is a historic issue. So that's why I said historic discrimination is what led to the Black Lives Matter movement, police brutality and murder of black people. And yes, I use the term murder because murder is what it is. We have to call it what it is, just like we call it racial hate. When we talk about Asian hate, it is hatred. Unfortunately, this is murder of black people. So, you know, I have to say when I was preparing this slide, of course, it, it, it is a personal concern for me as well being a person of African descent, a, a black person who's married to a man that I have to worry about coming home every day and whether he's gonna be safe when he's driving, when he's out in the, in the public, in the dark, all of these things I have to worry about, is he gonna make it home? You know, when I was doing my research on what to tell people on how to deal with it, I actually got kind of frustrated because again, we're changing who we are to address the issues of other people who are ignorant. So I didn't necessarily feel comfortable telling you to do something specifically different than what the rest of the world has to do in order to stay alive. But then I had to remind myself that the ultimate goal is for you to stay alive. So if it means that we do have to change our behavior because of someone else's ignorant actions until we have a better way, then that's what we have to do in the interim. So, you know, I know some of you might look at this and say, well, why do I have to go through all of this? And why do I have to do this? Why do I have to change who I am? Why can't they change who they are? If they could change who they were, then we wouldn't be where we are right now. I wouldn't have to explain to you how to interact with the police. You know, it's interesting because when, when Mr. Osaze talks about this subject in particular, he remembers being a very young child and his mother was looking at a child that was lost. And um, he said, oh, wow, you know, that, that child is lost. He doesn't know where his mother is. He should go to the police and tell them that I'm lost. And his mother said, no, don't go to the police. You look for a mo another mother because another mother will know what to do when a child is lost. You don't wanna have a child going to the police because the police don't necessarily know what to do with a lost child. And will the police make it worse? Possibly. And that's an unfortunate thing to think because you want to, to believe that the police will protect you. And I don't want to make a blanket statement that all police are bad because they're not. You know, I have police officers in my family. So I wanna make it clear that not all police are bad, but there are some bad apples in the bunch who have spread their disease to others and made other people just as bad because if they don't rat each other out, then that also makes them bad officers as well. You can't be a good cop and not talk about what's happening in your own precinct if you see it on a regular basis. So yes, we still have to look at the police as a protective force. I don't want anyone to think, now I can't trust the police at all, ever. But you also have to recognize that there are those police out there who are misinformed. Again, it's about not having the information, who are biased because how society has set up this whole image of particular people of different backgrounds and cultures and races. So we have to be mindful of that. So when interacting with the police, Regardless of whether you're Black, you're White, you're Asian, whomever, you're uh, Latinx, just don't run. You know, you don't want to set up a situation where you look guilty 
or they assume you're guilty, you may be running because you're scared, not because you did anything wrong. You might um, have been picked out just because you had a hoodie on and they thought you looked menacing. But the last thing you wanna do is run or walk away when you're stopped by an officer. You wanna find out why that person is stopping you. You want them to see that you're cooperative and that you're not of any harm and that you're willing to discuss whatever's happening. Now, they might already be charged up to 60 because they think, oh, well, you're about to do something. So keep your hands visible, you know, stop, assess the situation, let them know what's going on. If you were on your cell phone at the time, if you can keep your cell phone on, do it. You know, just keep, maybe you want to stick it in your pocket or something really quick or drop it on the floor because at least they can see what it was and it's no longer in your hand, it's no longer a threat, but whoever's on that other line can hear what's going on. So you're not alone in the situation. Don't argue, even if you know that you're right and that person is wrong, arguing is not going to get you anywhere in that particular moment. You might have to wait to argue your case. But what you wanna do is try to get the name and badge number of the person you're interacting with. So when you get out of the situation, you can report it. At least tell your parents or your family or your guardian or a teacher or someone what's happened and give the name and give the badge number of that individual so that you can try to deal with that. Again, keep your hands in sight at all times and follow directions. If they say drop what's in your hand, drop it. I don't care if it's the most expensive $1,000 Apple iPhone, it's not worth your life. So if your phone breaks, whatever, at least you're still there to get another one. So whatever is in your hand at the time they stop you, drop it and just keep your hands out so people can see that you are cooperating. Don't reach for anything. Now, if they ask you to reach for it and tell them exactly what you're doing. You've asked me to take out my identification and it's in my right pocket. Is it okay for me to go into my right pocket to get the ID that you have just requested? And if they say, do it, then I'm going in now, I'm taking out my ID and I'm gonna drop it so that you can see that that's my ID. Again, are we happy that we have to do these things? No. Am I happy that I have to tell you to do these things? Not at all. But I also want you to be safe. And I'm talking about dealing with anxiety and trying to deal with difficult situations. So I'm telling you the best thing that I can tell you as a woman who has to worry about black men all the time and how, um, yeah, I know this is breaking your, my heart too, um, Dr. Valma. I don't like this topic at all, but I do want people to know that um, you can get through it. Uh, you also want to travel in groups. I know that might also be counterintuitive because you're like, well, if I'm with a bunch of other Black people, will it just make them think that I'm in a gang or will they make it think, uh, you know, that we're doing something menacing? It's better to be in groups because now other people are there to witness what's happening. But if everyone does the same instructions that I mentioned earlier, you know, by not being com combative, not running, not walking away. So you have to talk with your friends. You're gonna to have to have a conversation with your BFFs and say, yeah, and I know it's gonna be weird. You're bringing this up to your friend and say, oh, you know, let's just talk about what we would do if we ever encountered the police. And they're gonna look at you like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> but you wanna have this conversation now and not at the time that it's happening. Because maybe you're with a group of four other people and one of your friends freaks out and runs. Now you have to worry about not his, just his life, but your own. So you wanna have these conversations now and have a game plan so that if, you know, heaven forbid this becomes an issue, you already know what to do and you're all on the same page. And if something happens, talk about it. You know, dealing with this is hard and you want to not keep it bottled in, especially for black men. I know you don't like to do the kumbaya thing. You don't like to talk about stuff. You like to keep things to yourself. It feels girly to be, you know, calling somebody and telling them your problems and all this other stuff. Nobody's telling you to have to shed tears and to you know, complain or whine, but it is important for you to at least tell somebody something has happened so it can, it can be addressed and other people can make sure it doesn't continue to happen because when you don't talk about it, it doesn't stop. So if the ultimate goal is to try to save lives and to educate people and to feel safe and to know that you're going to be okay, then I suggest that you at least talk about what happened if anything does come up and encourage your friends to do the same, okay? 
So I know that was a difficult topic and um, it's not something that everybody wants to address. But when we talk about safety and we talk about returning to school, returning to college, we have to think about these things. This happens on college campuses as well. You know, there are campus police. You know, I, when I was in college, some of my friends were followed by the campus police or right outside of my college town, there were Klan members who were part of the police and, uh, and were in the police station, had active Klan meetings in the community. Not saying all schools are in those types of communities, but you're gonna have to deal with race relations anywhere you go. So it's just best to talk about it now as opposed to avoid it and realize that the only thing that's happening in the world is not just our physical health in terms of um, having, you know, catching a, a disease, but also our mental well being and our physical health in terms of being safe going from point A to point B. So that's something that I want to make sure that people are aware of. So, the bottom line I know that was a heady topic, but I want to get back into the positive. You know, it's not all about the negative, it's not all about being scared, it's not all about worrying about how people see you, it's how you see yourself and feeling good about yourself and knowing if you did get into college. Congratulations, you were accepted to college. You're about to have a life-changing experience. If you're going back to high school, congratulations. You're about to see your friends and you're about to try to be as normal as possible with them. And you're gonna go back to playing your sports and doing all that fun stuff that you missed doing for the whole year and a half. So yes, life is going to get better. So one, believe in yourself, know that you're going to be fabulous. You're gonna be great. You're gonna do well when you get to school, whether it's high school or college, you're going to have support and we're all gonna be there for you know that people care about you. The staff at the Arthur Ashe Institute wouldn't have done this if they didn't care about you. They knew that you were going back to school. They knew that you were gonna be con concerned that you were gonna be worried. So they brought me in to make you feel better. So hopefully I am making you feel better and letting you know that you are loved, you are cherished, you are cared for, and we want the best for you. We also want you to care for others. Okay, so it's not always about you. Think about your friends. Think about what they're going through. Try to help them get through it. Try to be their buddy, try to be their BFF, try to make sure that they feel good about going back to school and let them know that you're gonna be there with them. Get involved and make a change. Like I said, nothing gets better if you don't talk about it. Nothing gets better if you don't get involved in an organization whose job it is to try to fix the ills of society. There will always be problems in the world, but the only way we can repair them is to get involved with some organization that can help deal with it. Live with purpose. You know, all of you are here because you want to be in a STEM field. You want, I'm sure when you wrote your essay saying why you want to be in the Arthur Ashe Health Science Academy, you're like, well, I want to be a doctor because I want to help with health disparities and I want to help cure, you know, this disease and that disease and I want to make things better in my community. So if that's what you really believe, then do it. You know, don't just write about it, do it. Live with purpose. What is your purpose? You know, why do you want to enter these fields? What are you going to do for other people? How are you going to impact the world? How are you going to be great? So I think a lot of you know, the things that make you feel good about yourself and to make you feel positive and to help you with anxiety is reminding yourself of why you're here and what your purpose is in life. Support your friends, you know, be there for them, talk with each other, tweet with each other, do whatever you have to do. Um, make stupid TikTok videos with each other. These are all things that you can do that are fun and safe because you don't have to actually be in each other's presence to do that, but you can have a good time. Um, ask for help. We've already talked about that. It's not taboo. It's nothing that you need to be ashamed of. Everybody needs help at the end of the day. Uh, I still ask for help and I'm not ashamed to do it. If there was something that you can help me with, I would ask you for help. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me how old you are or how young you are. If you have something I can benefit from, I'll ask you for help, so it's okay. Educate yourself, please. I have to say we are entering a world of anti-intellectualism. And why do I say that? Because when I get on YouTube, I can't tell you how many hundreds of stupid videos I'm watching where people have all these conspiracy theories. Of, if it's not aliens taking over the world, it's brain control or mind control. It's, you know, we've already talked about the, the crazy things people are saying about the vaccinations. Please, you know, you're going to learn about peer reviewed research and people who actually learn how to study learn how to vet information, learn what's real and what's not, you're gonna be at the top of the game. So please, what you learn, teach somebody else. When your friend posts a stupid video, 
tell them it's stupid. I mean, maybe you don't want to say it like that. <laughs> I'm not telling you to hurt your friend's feelings, but tell them what's wrong with the video and that they really need to pull it down because we don't need this kind of stuff out in the atmosphere. We don't need people thinking things that don't make sense. So tell your friends when it doesn't make sense and pull it down. And then maybe y'all can do a video together of something that makes more sense because you're going to be the one who has more knowledge because you're entering a field where you have to be able to know this stuff and enjoy new experiences. So if nothing else, we've had to be creative in terms of what was fun, especially after being quarantined and stuck in our houses for all this time. And I know now we wanna bust outside and put on our shortest shorts and run in, into the field and do whatever we wanna do and be chaotic. I know you wanna do that, but remember the stuff that you had to do to keep yourself sane indoors and continue doing it. Maybe you read more, maybe you played more games. You know, maybe you did some artwork, maybe you created something, you know, and all of this you were able to do now because you had time on your hands to do it, or now you were more focused because you didn't have to go anywhere. So continue to learn and experience new things. And when you get out into the world again, don't stop what you were doing, just expand on it. And that's going to make you feel much better about life and going back to see other people. Okay. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I am open to anything. You can ask me anything. I will answer it. So please, if there's anything that I did not address today or anything you'd like to discuss, this is a safe space. I will not judge you. Unless it's a stupid video. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I will not judge you. I want you to feel comfortable saying whatever and we can have a conversation here. This is what this is all about. It's about having time to, to, to share with others anything that might be of concern to help you deal with any anxiety. So fire away. And if there's anything that the Arthur Ashe staff feels that I uh, didn't address that I should address, let me know. I see a hand up from Nina. Um, hello. Um, my question is, um, well, I didn't really know about this term until I saw a TikTok video, but um, it was basically saying like, um, when you go to, you don't want to go to sleep at night because for the rest of the day, you did something that wasn't productive. And so you try your best to make up that time when you're supposed to be sleeping. And I realized like I have that issue. So how can like, I work towards maybe being more productive and not like saying, oh my God, I want free time at 12 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to watch a YouTube video. So how can I like get away from that type of vicious cycle, if that makes sense? Oh, sure. That's a great question. And you're just talking about how not to feel guilty and, and how to organize your time. Right. I also yeah. had a term for it, like something like revenge sleep, which I didn't actually, is that what you're talking about, Nina? <laughs> yes. Yes. That revenge was such a Sleep. term revenge <laughs> sleep i said well who are you getting revenge on and then <laughs> it's actually you're revenging you're getting revenge on yourself because you don't feel you did what you wanted to do anything frivolous so you stay up from like 12 to 3 doom scrolling another word that uh -huh. scrolling through social media but yeah it's called revenge sleep very odd term. It's funny. I didn't hear the term, but I do know the action of, of what you're talking about. And again, it comes down to not feeling guilty about having fun. I mentioned earlier, if you, if you work hard, you should play hard. And just like you schedule work, you should schedule time for fun. You know, it should be part of what you do on a daily basis. Every day you should have time for you. And keep in mind, if you didn't get everything done the day of, there's always tomorrow. So it's about prioritizing. What absolutely has to happen today? And if I don't do it today, then the world will fall to pieces. There's very few things like that, you know, but let's say you have a term paper due and you know you have a week to do it. Then you wanna try to organize your time and put in your schedule sometime each day that you'll work on it so you're not procrastinating. Because what ends up happening is if you wait until the day before, then you're gonna be upset because now you're gonna stay up all night working on paper and then you won't have any time to do anything fun. And then you're gonna say, well, I deserve to have some fun. I'm mad that I worked on the paper. And then you're gonna stay up until three o'clock in the morning trying to play Xbox or, or scroll through your, your YouTube or, or TikTok and all this other stuff. So it really comes down to prioritizing. If it's a paper or an exam that's coming up, prepare for it, know the dates for everything and write them down. Whether you write it in your phone, you write it in your notebook, you write it on a pad, whatever you use to organize yourself, 
you have to use organization. That's the only way that you can fight something like this. So you write down and have a to-do list and put it in an order of, you know, what's most important to what's least important. So you have a, a test tomorrow that's most important. You have a paper that's due next week, then you do it, then, you know, that's the second thing that's important. You have homework that's due um, in a month that goes underneath. So you, you look at your schedule and see what has to happen tomorrow, what happens, happens today, and what can wait for a week or two. And then once you've organized all of that into your schedule, then you have blocks of time where you're like, well, this block of time, I'm going to hang out with my friends. This block of time, I'm going to be in my organization, you know, whether I'm a cheerleader or I play soccer or I, you know, I box, whatever it is that you do for fun or after school, you put it in your, your schedule. And I know it seems, you know, like maybe only adults use scheduling, but no, people like you who are looking to enter these great fields of STEM have to be more mature and have to be prepared to do things that adults do and that's scheduling. So I would say, and that includes scheduling fun. I have dates with my husband because I know we're always busy and we get mad when we can't hang out with each other. So, you know, I'll put it in my calendar. Friday night, we're going to a comedy show or we're going to watch comedy on TV. I like the Black Lady Sketch Show. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite shows. I watch old David Chappelle um, shows, the Dave Chappelle um, comedy skits. You know, I will plan that out. I love The Walking Dead and Fear of the Walking Dead. So that is always on my schedule. I don't do anything else. Nine o'clock on Sunday, don't call me. Don't expect me to do any homework. <laughs> don't expect anything. And I was a student. I told, I don't know if you were on the call earlier, but I just graduated with my master's in public health. So I had classes, but I was not doing homework Sunday at nine o'clock because I was watching my TV show. So don't feel guilty about wanting to have fun. It's part of life. You can't be productive if you're not having fun because you're just going to be stressed and tired and you're not going to want to do the work. So I hope that answered your question, Nina. It did. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Just shoot like them at me. To, I'd like to make a comment that I suggest that people kind of ease into this because just like Dr. Sazi, I haven't been at Downstate since late January and that was for my COVID vaccination. So I'm gonna start going back into the office as of next week. In fact, after talking to Downstate today, we're gonna to actually have more of a presence at Downstate this summer, including the Duke interns will be allowed to come on to Downstate pretty regularly. So I'm both excited and anxious about that. But I know that I need to kind of practice getting up dressed and ready to get on the bus. I'm used to doing that for a Zoom meeting at 10, mm -hmm. but not to get to Downstate at 10 for an in-person meeting. That's gonna be an adjustment. So. You know, putting on real to, pants again is going to be an putting adjustment. Putting on pants and makeup, Guess right? Guess what? I have pajama pants on right now. <laughs> you don't know that because you can't see it, but I'm all dressed up from the waist up and I'm wearing right. pajamas on my bottom right. and, and flip-flops. But guess what? I can't do that when I go back to work. You yeah, can't do that when you go back to school. Wooten wants to kind of look at you a little odd. Um, but yes, yeah, so don't wait until September to suddenly expect to do 180 degrees, you should actually kind of come up with a schedule of easing back into. I think it'll make it easier for you and you can figure out where you need to make adjustments. But we're all, you know, we're all experiencing anxieties about re-entering, you know, the new normal because it's not gonna be old normal, that's gone, but the new normal is uh, unknown. And so it is arousing a lot of anxieties in all of us but it's all manageable. Yes, it's all manageable. Yeah. You know, there's nothing new that you're gonna experience that you haven't already dealt with. I mean, you've already done remote learning for how long now? So if you have to continue that, you'll be fine. You used to be in person, so you're just gonna go back to being in person. The only difference is you're gonna have a mask on your face and you're gonna keep your distance. So, you know, you'll be fine. And again, we're here, so if you ever need anything, you know, Arthur Ashe Institute is a fabulous organization. You can always call your mentors and your teachers that were in uh, the Health Science Academy and say, hey, you know, I'm back in school and this happened, you know, what should I do? So use your resources. That's why you have all these mentors around that care about you. Contact them and ask them questions. Thank you, Ms. 
Lisa Gonzalez is going to be distributing a workshop evaluation. And we always ask this question, but particularly now, we need to know, are there other workshops either related to this or not that you would like done this summer? One of the good parts about remoteness, one of the few, is that doing remote workshops allows us to reach more alumni and alumni who aren't here necessarily in New York. So one that we're thinking of doing this summer, particularly as we get to like August, is time management. Dr. Sazi, you know, touched upon it, but also, um, you know, reinforcing what does it mean to start really thinking about that transition if you're you know, a senior this year going into college is gonna be a big adjustment. And just going from remote to in-person is gonna be a big adjustment. So there are other topics you would like us to do um, sessions on. Um, you know, they, some of them may be one hour sessions rather than two hour sessions, let us know. We will find someone like a facilitator like Dr. Sazi to do it. And in addition to being able to participate live we can also make the recording available. So even if you don't get to be here now, you can still view it. So let us know what you need. That's what that's what we're here for, to help you. To help yep. you be successful. Yeah. And I'm already proud of you because I know that you're all entering a field where you're needed. You're, you're needed more than you'll ever know. And you'll be even more prepared because of what you've gone through. So the fact that you've seen COVID, you've seen what it does to patients, you've seen what it does to the community, now you'll be even more equipped to manage it. And you're gonna study this in your classes. They're gonna, I mean, they're gonna be case studies up the wazoo, you know, when you go to med school or PA school or nursing school, definitely public health. This is, I mean, they talk about this all day long now. So you're gonna be the expert in your field to be able to deal with something that physicians prior to you didn't have as much exposure to and they had to just learn on the fly. So you're gonna be even more dynamic in the fields that you enter. So we're already proud of you and the choices that you've made and, and the commitment and the change that you wanna make in the community. And Mr. Muhammad just dropped the um, Survey Monkey link in the chat box. So please make sure that you do that before you leave. And again, um, you know, thank you for taking the time. We know it's a beautiful summer day these are important issues and thank you very much dr Asaz. let's give you a round of applause oh, thank you because we really appreciate all this and uh you know it's 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 important topics other thank comments you, thank you nina other comments questions concerns and i think you came in a little bit late dr Valma. you missed the opening video so oh, when i send okay. out the when i send out the slides you need to, what happened so you can play for her once the alumni leave Oh yeah, oh, that's okay. okay. <laughs> but otherwise, unless anyone else has any questions, thank you again. Please do the survey. And, um, before you leave, if we can also just take a, a photo, uh, Dr. Yes. Daniel Sozazi, can you go to, back to your first slide? Oh, sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Plus on again. Wait, wait. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mr. Mahler, for uh, reminding. Okay, so now everyone just cheesily smile. And uh, Mohammed, let us know when you when you take the photo because we don't have the one, two, three cheese. Okay, yeah, no worries. So, one, two, three, cheese. Got it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful summer. We will keep in touch with the alumni and we're going to and uh, please Dr. Sazi and HSA staff stay on for a few minutes. Okay. Yes.